Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so today what I'll be talking about is about what is important and essential about computing. There's this trope in our culture that computers are all about binary, that like it's all about ones and zeros and that's really the only thing that matters. I think that a lot of people say this and you know we see it in movies and TV shows but we don't really understand exactly what it means. There's some ways that this is important and meaningful but there's other ways that it's just kind of trivial. To tell you a little bit, to get into this idea, let's talk about where it comes from. It ultimately comes from the fact that in the world we have electricity and magnetism. And there are two states of electricity, positive and negative charges, and there are two states primarily of magnetism, whether they're counterclockwise oriented or clockwise oriented. Now, one of the things that we can do is we can look at the world and we can actually measure these things. So we can look at the charge and measure something about it. One of my favorite quotes about uh, information is this quote from Gregson, who says that information is a difference that makes a difference. This is ultimately where the idea of binary comes from. We can measure a difference in the world, whether it's a positive or negative charge, and we can use that to store information. Every single piece of information that exists is physically realized somewhere. All your memories are physically in your brain somewhere, all the information in your computer is physically there. If we had an electron microscope, we could go figure out what you were looking at on your screen without actually looking at it. Now, <clears throat> so it's that sense in which, in which binary is sort of essential, but it's an essential part of the way that we made the computers. It's not really essential to the study of computing itself, which is what I really want to talk about. So this idea of information being a difference that makes a difference, what kind of differences could we have? It ultimately comes down to choices. Let's think about a really simple choice. Whether we're going to you know, turn to our left or turn to our right. We can encode this choice using a single binary number, a bit, which I'll represent with my thumb. So <clears throat> if I give you a thumbs up, then that means to turn left. I think left, yeah. And if I give you a thumbs down, then turn right. So let's all do it together. Okay, so let's run this program right here. So we'll run, let's see, we'll go down, what was that? That was turned to your right. Then up, left, down, right, up, left. Very good, okay. <laughs> so this is a really simple way of understanding what information is. It's a difference whether the signal from my hand is up or down and what difference that makes in the world. Now, this is the simplest idea of one bit of information, but simply being able to turn left and right doesn't actually allow us to do a lot of useful things. Imagine we're trying to navigate through this complicated maze, starting from the bottom, getting to the top. Now, it's not enough just to be able to go left and right. We also need to like move forward. And maybe if I'm watching someone try to go through the maze from above, I might give them directions like go backwards. Okay, so there's multiple pieces of information I want to give them. We could design an encoding scheme based on Look at that, I've got two thumbs, okay? So we can use two of them. So let's make a little scheme right here where we'll say that, you know, my left hand will be the, um, the yellow thumbs and my right hand will be the, uh, the tan thumbs, okay? So I can give different combinations of fingers, of thumbs, to give different inputs. So the left, right, forward, backward. Using this encoding scheme, we can make a little tiny program about how to navigate through this maze. Now, it turns out that this program takes nine different steps. So it takes nine pairs of binary digits. And something that's interesting about this is that, you know, it might be, a f it might feel a little bit exhausting to try to go through a program like this. Like, do it right now with your hands. Like, try to, try to run this program. I don't know about you, but I feel like it's really aggravating to try to go through it. And there's only nine of them. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I've never heard my computer complain about running a program of, you know, 90 instructions or 9,000 instructions. They never seem to complain. And that's what's really great about computers. Now, this part of running things on computers is actually not what we're going to be talking about at all tonight. The thing that I care about is the idea of when we have the information about the path that we want to follow, that ultimately what we're really talking about are these directions right here. Every single thing that you've ever seen on your computer is ultimately a sequence of bits. Now, <clears throat> you never, of course, think about this, right? When you look at that awesome, funny picture of the cat that wants a cheeseburger, it's like you don't have to know that what's behind there are a bunch of binary numbers. And <clears throat> this is actually a really important idea. We call this idea abstraction, that a good encoding scheme makes it so we don't have to know what's underneath. Like, not even the geekiest programmer looks at the mouse cursor and says, oh, 0110111, my old friend. 
Like, no one thinks that. Because, that, because in computer science, one of the things that we want to do is we want to create abstractions that totally hide the bits underneath. They make it so we don't need to know what they are. Let's relate this idea to something else. Look at this ring on my finger. Is this ring an abstraction like the mouse pointer? In many ways it is, because it's not really a ring, it's like a hunk of metal, right? And it's not just any hunk of metal, it's a hunk of platinum. But maybe it's not really a hunk of platinum because there's a whole bunch of other things in there too. But even thinking as a hunk of platinum is not really right either, right? This one ring is not one ring, to rule them all. It's really seven grams of platinum. And each one of those grams of platinum are made up of many, many platinum atoms. How many? Well, we can go look at the periodic table and it'll tell us. Works out to about two sextillion, which is really, really big. Now, each one of these platinum atoms is also an abstraction. It's an abstraction because inside of those atoms are protons and neutrons and electrons. Those protons and neutrons are themselves abstractions too. Physicists have discovered that the protons and neutrons are really different configurations of quarks. If you've got more down quarks, then you're a neutron. If you've got more up quarks, then you're a proton. So what I really have in my hand right here are about you know, 700 sextillion different up quarks and a, a roughly a similar number of down quarks all arranged in a particular configuration. And we call that configuration a ring. And we actually don't need to know about the quarks to understand the ring. In fact, maybe it would be worse if we knew about the quarks because it would be so complicated to figure out what would happen if I say drop the ring on the ground. But I can ask my daughter, who's three, what will happen when I drop the ring on the ground? And she'll say, Daddy, it'll make a noise, and then you'll lose it. Okay? So even a toddler can understand the abstraction, which is a true statement about reality, whereas the real details, the bits of the world, are complicated. This is a good abstraction. Now, it's related to an idea that I really like from Picasso, who said that art is a lie that tells the truth. What he meant by that is that when we look at art, we're feeling something real, but the art is not real itself. So you'll all go home and you'll remember my quote, which is that abstraction is a lie that tells the truth. So abstraction helps us understand the world. Now, this shows up in so many different ways. For instance, we can't understand what every single family in America is going through. But we, so we abstract those experiences away into things like the unemployment rate or life expectancy. Similarly, we can't understand the motivations and desires of every person in the 1800s that were trying to make their life better. We just summarize the whole experience as the Industrial Revolution. Did you know that every 30 seconds a new book is published in English? We can't understand all that's going on in those books, so we just generalize them to categories like, you know, torrid romances involving vampires and young adult fiction of dystopian futures and things like that. Now, <clears throat> At this point, it's important to step back a moment and realize that these abstractions sometimes don't tell the whole truth. One of my favorite paintings is this one. It says, this is not a pipe. This is called The Treachery of Images. It's really a statement about the danger of, of, of abstractions. Those statistics that I mentioned before, they lose a lot of important things about what's really going on in people's lives. When you read a history book and it says something like, you know, Napoleon invaded Vienna in 1805. We totally miss the fact that there's great human suffering with war, and that during that battle at one moment, you know, a French soldier, like, looked a Viennese soldier in the eye and, like, shot him and killed him. And then that Viennese soldier was never going home, and, like, his, like, an officer had to report back to his family that he's not coming back. When we read history books, we totally lose this. And it's impossible for us to really understand what so many people have gone through if we only care about abstractions. It's hard to get serious there for a sec. But that's not the kind of abstraction that we're really concerned about tonight because in computer science, we want the abstractions that don't have this property. We want the ones that are faithful to the truth. And with that, let's go back to the ring for a second. Sorry, let's go back to some other examples. So <clears throat> consider the ring. You know, when we think about what a scientist is, what a scientist is really doing is they are discovering what the abstractions in our life mean. So the physicists and the chemists, they look at the ring and they learn that what it really is are atoms and quarks and that sort of thing. What a biologist does, they look at living things and learn that they're cells and proteins and that sort of thing. There's this idea in primitive cultures that if you know something's true name, you have power over it. We're familiar with the story of Rumpelstiltskin, right? where when, when you learn his name, you can tell him what to do. 
This is what motivates our quest to understand abstractions. For instance, one of my favorite authors, uh, Jane Austen, she died of the coughing sickness. And it's, you know, it's cute for us to hear it called that. But what they didn't realize then was it was really a colony of myobacterium tuberculosis interfering with her life. And that when doctors could understand what was really going on, they could then control it and start trying to attack it. I call this principle name and conquer, and it's what motivates our quest to break abstractions. But that's not the kind of abstractions that we deal with in computer science, because those, those are abstractions that are, dis that are discovered, whereas an artist is an inventor of, of abstractions. Let's go back to the ring again. This ring, is it just the quarks? Is it just an abstraction going down? Or is also the base of an abstraction going up? You see, the ring isn't just any ring, right? It's on my left hand, and it's on this finger, which you all know is called the ring finger. So that means that this ring isn't really a ring at all. It's really a wedding ring. And a wedding ring isn't a hunk of metal. A wedding ring is a symbol of love. And we make it into a circle shape because a circle has no beginning and no end. It's symbolic of the eternal love that we want to share with our spouse. And it's my goal for my family as well. That's art. This is art that was made you know, this concept of the abstraction of the ring as a symbol of love is something that's 8,000 years old made by ancient Egyptians. And it's so powerful that it's come down to our life today and we still use it. That's the kind of abstraction that you build when you are a computer scientist and a programmer. It's really trendy right now to tell kids like, oh, you should learn about programming because, you know, animations and games, they're so fun. And, you know, maybe you'll get like a job being a programmer. It's a great job. It is a good job. but. Like, that's not why programming and computer science is important. It's not because, you know, making games and apps is so cool. It's not because you might get a job doing this. It's not even because if you do something else, like be an engineer or a scientist, you'll also need programming. The reason why is that programming is the systematic, de the systematic design of abstractions. And in that sense, it's a systematic approach to human creativity. So let's take an example a human approach to creativity that solves particular problems as well. So let's take an example of, you know, you're a theater operator. So this theater operator, they have a human problem, which is that they need to make money to survive. Okay? Now, if you are a programmer, you want to think about this as how can we turn this human problem into a question about information? You know, it's like when you're reading a word problem in math class, like you're trying to, you're trying to identify what matters. Okay? So you, you look at the information, you know, that you have the cost of running the theater, what movies you're going to show. There's all sorts of information inside of the theater, even things like, you know, what color are the carpets, or, you know, do you serve juju beans, or, you know, milk does, or that sort of thing. Now, some of that information may not be relevant. And if you try to approach things totally from first principles, maybe you won't realize that something like the color of the carpet actually does matter, right? Because psychologists have found that, you know, red keeps us awake and it influences our buying decisions, that kind of thing. So maybe it's good to care about that. Now what a programmer does is they take this information and they try to build an abstraction from that information to something that a computer can actually work with, for instance, like numbers. Now at that point, many people telling you about computer science will say, well, at that point you then solve the problem. But actually the programmer doesn't solve the problem. A human solves the problem, and what the programmer does is they encode the solution into a computer. In this case, mathematics has a solution for this and it's called optimization. What optimization does is it's like that maze that I showed before. You know, if I gave you a theater to run, you would try all sorts of different things, but you might get tired or run out of money making bad decisions after, you know, nine or ten. But a computer can explore and simulate millions of combinations. And that's what the, that's what the study of mathematical optimization is. And what comes out of that is just numbers. But those numbers are not a solution. They're just bits. They're just quarks. We can't understand them. An essential skill of the programmer is to build an abstraction into the problem and out of the solution, to turn whatever the numbers are back into something that we can actually use in the real world. But even then, that information isn't the solution. The solution only happens when humans can understand and use that abstraction, that information, to make differences in their life. Information is a difference that makes a difference. And only at that point has the problem been solved. This is what you do in all sorts of scenarios, whether you're running a program or whether you're you know, running a marketing campaign or something like that. When you think about what computer science is, you know, when I think about it as a professor, 
I think of computer science as the study of different ways of building abstractions. We have all sorts of different terms for kinds of abstractions, when to use them, in what situations, and what they mean. And some of them are really complicated. But the thing that ke that's all in common about computer science is that we have a systematic approach to taking that information and turning it into these abstractions. Now, what I want you to sort of leave with the perspective of is that computer science has much more in common with art than with many other fields because it's a place where you look at the world and you do not take it as given. You're not discovering what's underneath reality. You're inventing your own reality. And in that sense, computer science is a deeply creative, ex creative experience and an expression of human ingenuity. We should give these sorts of fields, the same honor that we give to things like you know, poetry and art and music. There are many things that are not just like computer science that do this. When we look at social sciences, we can see that as building abstractions to understand human relationships. And we should think of those as art, but not in a way to put them down, but as a way to elevate them up. Thank you so much for having me here. <laughs>